Sorcerer of the Wild Deep by Kaya Shanti Wilson, uh, which is a uh, really interesting, epic, epic kind of epic fantasy uh, novella that really I can't explain all that well. Hmm. It's not totally my thing, hmm. but I know it resonated with a lot of people really strongly, and it's the kind of novella you would expect to be nominated. And the other one is Binti uh, by Nettie Okorfor. Again, Nettie is one of those people, when she writes something, you kind of have to take notice, mm -hmm. and there's a pretty good chance that she'll, she'll get that kind of recognition. That said, novella is suddenly becoming an actual interesting category. Yeah. You know, yeah. in years past, I think there were only so many novellas published, and you could kind of see just what names published them, and you could kind of be like, all right, well, Scalzi published a novella, Charles Strauss, you know, published a novella, like, they're going to be on the list. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, I think you're going to start seeing some really interesting names get nominated for a novella, where people are actually going to want to seek them out, you know, they're not going to be kind of, um, uh, well, they're, they're just more interesting. Well, with the other novella I had on my list was the, the, Citadel, the Citadel of Weeping Pearls by oh. Elliot Davidard, yes, which yeah. is in uh, the uh, October-November Asimovs. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Sorry, I just remembered one. Because, I don't know. Oh, yes. Go ahead. No, no, please continue. Uh, I, I, it's a hard story in many ways to describe because a lot of what makes it really great is just the 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 the, the, the whole future that she set up there, which is basically a far future story, but but it's clearly from descendants of Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. um, and this one involves basically a space station that had disappeared many years in the past and the attempt to find it, but. That makes it sound almost like a hard science fiction story, but this one is sort of focused on the characters and there's, uh, in, in, in a way, and the background in ways that they're just marvelous. And, and, and I really like her writing style. She's, she's, she's a beautiful writer, and uh, uh, I'd love to see this one on the Hugo Valley. Is that related to her novel, The, the House of Shattered Wings? Or? I believe so, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Which so, is another debut this year that mm -hmm. Bear's talking about, actually. Is that her debut? Her novel? Is it her debut novel? No. no. Oh, she did all the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She did all the Obsidian uh, stuff, yeah. No, no, she's like, yeah, forever. Um, but uh, you, mentioning Asimov's reminded me, um, there's an amazing novella by E.J. Fisher uh, called The New Mother, uh, which is stupendous science fiction. It's the, the premise is basically um, there's a disease that is rendering men sterile at the same time that it's making uh, women's um, ova diploidal, so that women can, are, are just, are, women become pregnant every time they menstruate. Uh, no, that's right. Every time they, every cycle, basically. So women are just constantly getting pregnant uh, without men, and they're giving birth to clones of themselves. Uh, and it's a disease that is sexually transmitted. So this is it's, it's a novella that very systematically and very, very intelligently and empathically goes through every facet of society um, in, in America, specifically in America, for, for very good established reasons in the, 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 the There's a, a female journalist who is uh, pursuing this story and is writing a piece about it. So you're getting kind of her gathering her information about this piece of journalism um, and her interviewing like, uh, politicians about it, medical professionals about it, um, and talking to family members about it and stuff like that. It's really, really brilliantly done. Uh, and absolutely, highly, highly, highly recommend it. Um, other novella I'd really recommend, which is the total opposite of that, there's a um, wonderful writer named C.S.C. E. Cooney, uh, and she is so good, and it, she's so often just overlooked. That she doesn't do a lot of promotion and stuff, but she's just such a fantastic writer. She writes, um, she writes, sort of, she writes in the genre of fairy tales. She doesn't retell fairy tales per se, but all the stories that she writes kind of partake of the language and s just like feeling of fairy tale. So uh, to me, she like writes original fairy tales, like adventure story things. And she's got a, a collection out called Bone Swans and other stories. Uh, and the novella in Bone Swans is uh, the only piece that's original. Uh, and it's called Bone Swans. Um, well, yeah, it's called the it is called Bone Swans or Bone Swans of Annandale or something like that, uh, and it's a retelling of the um, uh, uh, of a few different like a few <coughs> different fairy tales kind of joined together. It's just delightful and fantastic. Mm. Overall, I think uh, one thing I'd like to comment on. I mean, the short fiction category it's, it's really hard to predict because mm -hmm. there's 
there's just so much good fiction out there spread across so many different platforms mm -hmm. now that I think one of the reasons we had the situation last year was it's hard to get a consensus and mm -hmm. so if a bunch of people block them, they're going to dominate. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's great in so many different ways. I mean, there's a lot of stuff online. The, the magazines are still publishing good stuff and we're yeah. always getting a, a handful of really good original anthologies. I mean, I'll pick up anything that Jonathan Strawn edits. Yeah. And, and, and so at least all of the stories are usually at least good, and there's always at least a couple out of them that I'll wind up on my Hugo Battle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any other comments on the short fiction before we try to go quickly through a couple of other categories and oh, try great. to leave some time for the... Uh, um, if you want to know how to go back and look for stories you've heard about and stuff that's not published, I think most like Nicholas White's done this already. So you go to his live journal, Nicholas White with an, a Y, W H Y T, and you can go like a lot of them. You can uh, you have to buy the e copy, but you can get the e copy of the like Asimov's Analog. Mm -hmm. I don't know about FNSF. I don't know. And I think he only he sort of focused on Asimov over Analog. He doesn't talk about Analog very much. Hmm. Yeah. So go, go, going down to a couple of other uh, categories quickly. Um, Dramatic presentation, beyond the two obvious ones that are going to probably be on the ballot, which are The Martian and Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> any other any other uh, movies that, uh, or, or long- Mad Max. Yeah, Mad Max. Three obvious ones. Mad Max, definitely. Mad Max. Uh, I really liked Inside Out. Inside Out. A lot. <laughs> I like Inside Out. And it's Macanow. We've just done it. No, 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 no. See, in, Inside Out, I think, should have been on the Best Picture nomination, because I thought it was the best movie of all of last year, but it's-, it's so, there's a movie, I haven't seen it yet, but I really want to, and I really want everyone who's going to nominate this category to just consider it. It's called uh, A Woman Walks Home Alone at Night. Oh, yeah. And it's an Iranian vampire movie. Oh. And it's like an Iranian vampire filmed in Western. Los Angeles. Yeah, an Iranian <laughs> vampire Western filmed in Los Angeles. And I'm like, surely this should be the kind of thing that like Hugo voters are going to be all over. And it's apparently, it's, I, I only heard about it because uh, Mark Carmode, who's this amazing, fantastic film reviewer, um, this, like um, British film reviewer, does this podcast called Wittertainment. Um, he mentioned it in like his top 10 best films of the year and it was at number two, beaten out by Inside Out by Fortnite. So, uh, but I really, really want to see it. I really want loads of people to see it so that just something totally out of not Hollywood, like, you know, would, would just, yeah. Like well, Ex Machina. Somebody might actually well, show up to accept the award. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like Ex Machina, but, I, but it, I don't think it'll make my list given some of the other stuff out yeah. there. I'll, I'll throw out three titles just really quickly without <laughs> saying much about them. Predestination, which is High yeah, All You Zombies, yeah. uh, which, which worked quite well. The Jonathan Strange and Mr. No, <gasps> that was which, so good. Which, which, which was also quite so good. Uh, quite well done. Yeah. And, 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 and my sort of dark horse, uh, because, be, be, because, because it will never make it, but uh, is I, I like audio uh, some of the audio adventures, particularly the, the, some of the Doctor Who stuff that's been mm -hmm. finished. It, the, oh. And Dark Eyes, which oh, is yeah. Paul McGann. The, the, if had Paul McGann gotten to be the Doctor for more than just that me, bad movie that he was yeah. in, he would be remembered as one of the great, maybe the best Doctor ever. And his mm -hmm. audio adventures are wonderful. And Dark Eyes, Dark Eyes Four, the fourth, the fourth and final Dark Eyes came out last year, mm. and it was very good. Big Finish does a lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can I, can I ask, I don't know if we have time to really get into this, but, you know, when we when we nominate for movies, we often uh, take into account stuff that's humorous. And going mm -hmm. back to the fact that why are we so willing to do that with movies and not so much to do that with fiction? That's such a good question. We've done that occasionally with fiction. Occasionally, or, yes. Or, or, and, and, and we had the case where Terry Pratchett was nominated yeah. but withdrew. Yeah. Yeah. So, the exception the rule, I guess. I think that's a good question. Well, actually, it's funny because I think that humorous or lighthearted novels are more likely to be on the ballot and or win. Uh, I mean, like, Red Shirts was really funny. Yeah. Yes, Red Shirts yeah. feels like the only one, though. I mean, I, I don't have the list in front of me, but I think a lot I remember of like, getting, getting hope with frankly, Red Shirts. There's not much that's published in the first place. I mean, you're yeah. talking one or two titles a year, mm. maybe, that would fit. Like, Aileen Martinez does it sometimes. Um, they're not holds, but they're super Like Very few breakout like, actual humor books get, get done, and I don't know why that is, but I think it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And, 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 especially to be broadly resident. And, 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 all the funny, and all the funniest Henry Cutler stuff predated the Hugos. <laughs> <laughs> the Proud Robot would, I would, would have won a Hugo had it, the Hugos been around. To answer your question, Mark, I think it's because we as people who participate in this field 
take our fiction way more seriously than we should, mm -hmm. and that because we don't participate in the production of film, mm -hmm. we don't have to take it as seriously, That's and we don't, it doesn't mean but, as much to our identity, but, yeah. where our written fiction does, mm -hmm. and so we want to take it extremely seriously. I think. That's but, 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 but I don't think it's just our field. I mean, going, going back far enough, Groucho <coughs> Marx complained about uh, the fact that, you, that, that people didn't appreciate how good and how hard, good humor was and how hard it could be to do mm -hmm. good humor. I, I, so, sorry, I'm comment. sorry, just to, so I've been watching a lot of no budget or real low budget videos out on YouTube, mm -hmm. and so they're getting better. You know, there's, there's a lot of junk out there, obviously. I just wonder if any of you have, you know, looked at any of that and would, would start to get to the point where maybe you can start comparing mm -hmm. some really low quality, low budget stuff to, you know, better quality. Yeah. Can I quickly, I want to quickly mention one. There's a one, I was involved in a, in a small zombie movie in Pittsburgh called The Other Side. <clears throat> very, very cheaply done, <clears throat> would be eligible this year, but <clears throat> it was really one of the most intelligent zombie movies I have ever seen, because zombie movies tend to just do the same thing over and over again, and this one, well, had a little of that, but it, but it also had other things actually happening in the movie. So if you like zombie movies, The Other Side, it's on, on demand, and technically it is eligible. I will not be voting for it, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to think that as long as you have big budget TV and Doctor Who, yeah. anything out on YouTube is not going to be paid attention well, to. I, I remember The Guild when it came out. It was like astonishing. Like, yeah. The fan following of The Guild was enormous, <coughs> and I loved it. Like, I really enjoyed it. Um, the thing that I think YouTube is going to be sort of really... Uh, Kind of what blows me away with YouTube stuff is cartoons, uh, like the eleven-minute cartoons, things like Adventure Time or Steven Universe. Like Steven Universe is what I would be putting down yeah, on in I, any kind of. I think it's got a good, yeah, it's got a chance. I hope so because it's it's the best thing I have ever watched on television, and I, I'm not saying that hyperbolically. So it's called Steven Universe. Steven Universe. It's a children's okay. cartoon. It's on YouTube. Um, yeah. Oh, actually, no, you it's, cartoon. Cartoon. So it's, it's on Cartoon Network. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, but um, it's on. It's Steven Universe is a children's cartoon. The episodes are 11 minutes long, and in 11 minutes, it does more work with character and uh, world building and kindness and beauty and joy and love um, than anything I've seen done with uh, live action stuff. It's 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 just it's it's game changing. Um, the the and I, I sort of shut down when I start talking about it because I just. I love it so much. And I say this as like a long-time Doctor Who fan, and usually when you're a Doctor Who fan, it's kind of like there's that place in your heart that's already <laughs> occupied. But it's like, no, it has displaced Doctor Who. Oh. Uh, like, it's, it is a, it's better, it's doing more things. It makes me cry every single oh. episode that I watch of it just is like some kind of soul enema. I don't know, it's like... <laughs> say in brief what it's about. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steven Universe... Well, she said soul enema. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes like, nine metaphors out of ten I can usually yeah, but like no uh, Steven Universe is about a little boy named Steven. He's like I think a little ten or eleven or yeah. something when it starts. He's eight, yeah. Yeah. Um and he uh he has a, a gem in his belly button. And he is a member of this group called the Crystal Gems. Uh the other crystal gems are Amethyst, Garnet, and Pearl, and they each have like a gem, and they are uh, just magical ladies who fight magical threats. And she starts out being this thing. It's, it's very anime influenced. Um, and like anime aficionados who watch it are blown away by this. Like, oh my god, it's referencing the super obscure anime, etc. Uh, which you totally don't need to know to enjoy it. But um, as it develops, it's much, much more about the world building of who are these gems? Where do they come from? Stephen is a human gem hybrid. Why is that? How did this happen? So the first like, I don't know, 20 episodes or so are about Stephen trying to figure out how to use his powers and join the Crystal Gems. After that, though, every single episode escalates the stakes, the world building, the character development, the uh, character relationships. It's all about relationships between women. It's about the primacy of friendship. It's about, like, basically everything that I have been clamoring for more of in the media that I consume over the last, meh, five, six, seven years, it's doing all of. It's like, it's like, and it's also, the first Cartoon Network show to be helmed by a woman, uh, Rebecca Sugar, who, was, who basically did all the best Adventure Time episodes, uh, is the, the showrunner for, for Steven Universe. And it's magnificent. It's, um, it's just unlike anything else. And the episode in particular that I think would be the, would be the best example is Jailbreak. Jailbreak is like, 
it cr it crests there, yeah. and then it like that. That's where you just everything is building towards that moment. Try not to get spoiled for what happens in, in Jailbreak. Just like just just watch. It's going to be hard. For, it's going to be hard for the nomination side because yeah, it is definitely yeah. one of those that as as a series of ten minute ones, yeah. um, and and it's very odd because they they simultaneously stand alone and build. Yeah. Um, but but from kind of like a nominating perspective, Jailbreak is totally on my ballot. Yeah, me too. Carl has a question. Oh, well, while we're talking about um, things by Rebecca Sugar and things that are on YouTube, she has an original series called Eating Puppy Cat, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, Rebecca Sugar didn't do that. She, she did not. No, that's that. Natalie... Um, oh, what's her, what's her name? It's another very influential woman. Yes, yes, yeah, she... Okay. she uh, oh, I've <laughs> forgotten her name. But it's, it's not Rebecca Sugar, though. Okay. But it's a wonderful series. You're absolutely right. Being Puppy Cat is fantastic. And it is available like primarily on YouTube. Right? Yeah. Natalie or Natasha? So, yeah. We've only got about five minutes left. So what I'd like to do is jump away from from this year's to give at least five minutes to the 1940s. Oh, yeah. uh, Can you illuminate about what might, might be eligible for the 1940s? Yeah, if, like I said, Nick, Nicholas White, uh, he's collated all his crap. Well, Sorry, all, all the sources. <laughs> novella, probably the key one, is uh, Harry Bates's Farewell to the Master, which was the basis for uh, the day oh, the year's 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 Did not make his list. Wow. Really? wow. No, was, shame, Nicholas. <laughs> Nicholas, well, Nicholas, he went out of his way, like he said, he read everything. He's not going by because he said Slan's going to make the ballot, but I don't think it deserves to be there. Hmm. Slam, slam by E. Van Boyd. It depends upon what, what it's, the, it's be the importance of historical importance versus yeah. how the best good, novel good of that year. Yeah. The, the oh, slam had a lot of influence on what was to come, but it really, Van, Van Vogt should never have gone beyond short stories. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, some good short you know why? Stories, it's, it's you know why I didn't make the novella list? Because it's a novelette. Uh, oh, uh, it's uh, okay. So, so, like, so I've got it in the wrong place. I feel really list. bad, but I don't know what those are. I like the list of novels that I've ever heard of. What um, besides slam? The ones of Teacher King by T. H. Oh, yeah. Oh. That, that, yeah. yeah, basically, oh, it, okay. it's another chapter of that one. Oh, but it's not the ones of Teacher King. No, it's the Ill-Made Night Teacher King. Or, like, yeah. 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 Uh, well, I, I mean, the thing to remember that, that that always makes the retro Hugo's hard is mm -hmm. up until probably the fifties, novels weren't that important in science fiction. There were a few of them, but science fiction was dominated by short fiction. Mm -hmm. And that's where, if, if you look at the classics of the 40s and 50s, there are a few novels scattered in there, but most of it is short fiction. And you go back into 1940, yeah, yeah, we can start dragging up a couple of novels, but there's a lot more good short fiction. Yeah, especially things like Foundation. Which we think of as novels and they're really... Yeah, but Foundation then was a, the, the yeah. first, uh, all of the Foundation stuff that we think of was, was a series of short works exactly. that got cobbled exactly. together into novels. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on, on the short fiction level, the Theodore Sturgeon's It and Robert Heinlein's Requiem are, are both short stories from that year, which, are, which were quite good. Um, at Novelette, uh, the, one, of the, one of the ones I've got is Ross Rockland's Into the Darkness, which... Rockland did this series of short works that were basically about intelligent nebulas, is what it came down to. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very strange, but, uh, but very innovative and nicely done. And almost nobody's heard of Rockland anymore, but he actually wrote a handful of good short works. What else did you have in your list, Jeff? Um, I, this, is not, this is Nicholas White's list. Okay. I'm going to throw out some names you might recognize. Um, under short stories, uh, he has The Stellar Legion by Lee Brackett, the first of Ravina's stories. Um, and what else do we got here? There's no plug. All right, so, um, and then so other short stories um, Talon Akbar Orbis de Terrace by Jorge Luis Boya, The Piper by Ray Bradbury, John Duffy's Brother by Plan O'Brien, and Quietus by Rock Rockland. Is it a rock rock? Yeah, yeah. Not a lot. He had, well, there's where Farrell off the master showed up. I'll have to go check the one. Um, New York Fights the Germanites by Bertrand Shirtwood. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to look up. I'm going to have to look up the bracket. I, I like Brackett. And Brackett, one of the only, probably the only science fiction writer to ever co author something with William Faulkner. And the interesting thing wow. you said about the short really? fiction. They, they together wrote the, uh, the, the screenplay for The Big Sleep. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Yeah. The, the trend he said for 1940 
was uh, most of the stories were either set in New York City or Mars. <laughs> That's fantastic. What is that correlation? <laughs> War of the Worlds by Orson Welles. That's amazing. Yes. <coughs> no, but the thirty it was in thirty nine. And it won it won the Hugo, the retro Hugo for thirty nine. Right. But yeah. Is there anywhere online where this conversation about like what to read for the retro Hugo is being held? I, I don't know anything. N White, N White, lo, lo, go to Live Journal and look for N White, N W H Y T E. Yeah. The the other thing and, to, <coughs> sorry, go ahead. Yeah, because he's he's got all this stuff, and then he's got links to the guy that to collated all the short fiction that he then used to read. The, the, the other thing to look for is there was a series of anthologies that I think Daw put out about 15, 20 years ago called Asimov Presents the Great Science Fiction, Volume One, Volume Two, Volume Three. Volume One was nineteen. But basically, it was Asimov and Greenberg uh, and one other editor doing a best of the year series for years that didn't have best of the year series. And volume one was 39, volume two was 1940. And one of the ways I reminded myself of what was out for 1940 is I pulled volume two off the shelf and read volume two. I would just say people that are like going to this effort of reading things from 1940, like I applaud that because I mean, that's some dedication, man. Like, I, I think the Hugos are important, so I want to make no, sure no, that I at least like, put yeah, some effort into it. I give people props for it. It's, yeah. uh, it's hard enough to get all the ones done for last year, let alone. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the two it's years. Yeah. It's the omens work. If, if, if there were a lot of novels in 1940, it would be really There horrible. were a lot of novels. Well, but a lot of them that I actually felt, felt well, compared to going today, back to yeah, I'm yeah. super curious, actually. Um, is there a retro Hugo category for graphic works? No. No. I think it's best artist. No, no, no. Every because isn't it every category? It's every the same category, category is the same category. Now exists. Categories. If there were enough things of that, because well, comics, because like this is, we're talking like pre-code right. uh, oh, comics, right? That's yeah. true. So it'd be amazing to actually get some like a really foundational point. comics yeah. on there. If enough, if enough, I, if enough things right. are it's nominated in that, in that category, yeah. yeah. If enough things are nominated in that category, then it goes to the vote. Oh, yeah, definitely right. talk that up among. Yeah. Because I would love to see that. We should actually, we should actually think about a project <laughs> yeah. of Saladin's because he's, yeah. he's yeah. so yeah. active in the. Um, yeah, he was talking about comics. that earlier. Oh man, if you don't follow Saladin Ahmed on Twitter, you really, really should because he like he has been going through these like libraries of amazing pre uh, pre comics code comics, and it's full of women. It's like full of of women crime fighters and like. Uh, how it's just fantastic. It's really transgressive stuff, um, and it tends to not be part of the way that we construct like the narrative of golden age comics and stuff like that. All of this stuff, you know, doesn't really make it onto courses about it. Even as we're seeing more and more courses about comics uh, nowadays in, in universities and stuff. So I, I love. Like, it, it's just a really exciting opportunity. I think. Yeah. Because um, I really like the idea of the retro he goes, and I, I like to, especially in terms of making conversations between like. Why are we choosing these things from the see, yeah, in our moment? That's right? my gripe. I don't vote for retro Hugo's, and the whole reason I don't is because the awards represent what people that year felt about this material. Hmm. We are looking back. So <laughs> that means, for example, we might not take one that treats a black person racistly, but is otherwise well written, because we would not, you know, that but, would probably but, but, be too. But, but you're, you're putting your slant on what you think that they should be voting. I'm voting yeah. for looking back over the years what I think the best story. I'm not trying to vote on what I think that somebody in 1940 would have thought was the best no, story. No, it, it, it's very much simultaneously both mm -hmm. what the, What's you know, what, yeah. you know, it's, it's both, a, it's both the 2016 award and, you know. And, 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 and I like it because it does start the conversation about these old stories and it gets, gets some people who might not have seen them to go take a look at it. Yeah, I've not heard of any of those, so that, that sounds really cool. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay, we're out of time, thank but you thank you very much. Thank you.